entire world of connection. It allows me to volunteer and give back to the community. first and really prepare you to solve any number of the world's big problems. The skills that you're going to be learning can completely change the future. All right, good morning, FTC teams. All right, well, thank you for joining us here today at Space Center Houston for an official kickoff of the first Tech Challenge Rover Ruckus Competition. My name is Casey Hines, and I'm an education manager here at Space Center Houston and a former first FLO coach. I was thrilled to learn that all levels of the FIRST Robotics competitions this year had a space exploration theme to them because it is the mission of Space Center Houston to inspire all ages through the wonders of space exploration. The Manned Space Flight Education Foundation is a nonprofit education foundation with extensive science education programs and an exploration center. We host evening education programs, overnights where you can sleep among the artifacts that have flown in space, field trips, and our intensive five-day engineering design program called Space Center University. We are our official visitor center of NASA Johnson Space Center and a Smithsonian affiliate. After collaborating with the local FTV, FTC senior mentors, we knew that Space Center Houston would be a perfect venue to host a kickoff for this event as a, it is our objective to share NASA and space industry missions, and this season your mission is about space exploration. We have a very exciting morning lined up, including hearing from space industry experts, the release of this year's Rover Ruckus Challenge, and afterwards you get to go out into Astronaut Gallery and see the new playing field for yourselves. Are you ready for launch? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna start off with an out of this world panel of experts to have a discussion about the challenges of space exploration. We want you to start getting ideas on how to overcome your space-related obstacles and how working as a team is critical to the success of your mission. So first up, I'd like to welcome Selena Dopart. She is a human factor systems engineer for Boeing's commercial crew program. She helps support the development and testing of the Commercial Space Transportation CST-100 Starliner spacecraft and integrated launch and ground systems. She works with every Starliner subsystem to ensure the design enables astronauts to operate the, the vehicle effectively, efficiently, and of course, safely. An aspiring astronaut herself, Dopart earned her Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and the Master of Science in Aeronautics and Aeronaut Aeronautics and Astronautics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her master's research involved technology for zero and microgravity extravehicular activity mobility units, commonly known as jetpacks. She knows about jetpacks, that's awesome. <laughs> so give a warm welcome to Selena. <laughs> Next up, we have Andy Reckenberg. He is a self-proclaimed space and technology geek. Woohoo! And, <laughs> and a senior information technology infrastructure architect with over 18 years of experience in the enterprise IT field. He has extensive experience in a variety of IT systems, including data storage, virtualization, and computer networking. He currently works at NASA's Johnson Space Center as a network communications subject matter expert and the crew net system manager in the Information Resource Directorate. 
He has previously worked in the Mission Control Center as an International Space Station Flight Controller and a Space Station Support Computer Specialist. He has a bachelor's degree in computer science and graduated from the University of Illinois at Springfield. In his spare time, Andy teaches group fitness classes, enjoys running half marathons, and is a DJ. He goes by DJ Flux. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have Tiffany Swarmer, who grew up as an Air Force brat and spent her early years exploring the U.S. from coast to coast with her family. <laughs> she earned a Master of Science degree in Space Studies from the University of North Dakota and a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Sonoma State University. Tiffany worked with NASA's flight analog team as a lead human exploration research analog, also known as HERA, and the crew medical officer and lead EVA specialist for a 120-day Mars analog simula simulation. This was done through the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog Simulation, or High Seas program. She worked closely with the University of North Dakota's Human Spaceflight Laboratory to develop and test planetary spacesuit concepts and analog lunar Martian habitats. Currently, she works at NASA's Johnson Space Center as a crew systems trainer for the International Space Station. Thank you, Tiffany. So at this time, we're going to allow each of our panelists to share a little bit of their story and their passion with y'all today. And we're going to start off with Selena. Thank you so much, Casey, for that introduction. You made my job a little bit easier by already saying what my background is. So I will jump right into it. The CST-100 Starliner. <laughs> um, show of hands, who knew before they came here what the CST-100 Starliner is? OK, not everybody, but don't worry. A lot of people don't know what it is. Um, in short, it's America's next ride to space. So right now, since the end of the space shuttle program in 2011, American astronauts have only had one way to get to the space station the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. So NASA has decided we want to bring that capability back to the United States. So they've asked Boeing and SpaceX to build spacecraft to do the exact same thing. Um, so I work for Boeing CST-100 Starliner, and we are planning on being the next spacecraft to take American astronauts from American soil to the International Space Station and back. So a little bit about me and my background, expanding on what Casey already told you. I was born and raised in Washington, DC. Um, I am a, I've always loved space, and um, part of the reason for that is my dad's a space geek, my mom's a teacher, and that made for the perfect combination of making learning really fun when I was a kid. So we did science experiments in my kitchen when I was younger. Uh, my dad helped me start a science club when I was in fourth grade. Uh, I got a telescope for Christmas one year, and really space and science in general was always a fun thing. We explored it at home, we explored it in nature, uh, and it was, never, it was never work for me. Um, beyond that, though, the things that I listed here, I wasn't really focused on STEM in middle school and high school. Um, and I say that not because it is a bad idea to be really focused on STEM starting early, um, but because I think a lot of students your age have a lot of pressure to build your resumes, focus on technical things. If you think you want to be an engineer, you've got to start really early. Um, and I think the most important thing to do to get a career in engineering is pick something that you love. Um, so I've always been obsessed with space, and that's why I'm here today, not because I was in advanced science and math courses in high school, which I wasn't, by the way. Um, it was because I loved it, and I, it's what I decided to do. So I think this first robotics competition is an awesome chance for you guys to find something that you really love doing. It's fun, but you'll also learn a ton. And that's kind of been my philosophy for everything. Um, when I went to college, I decided that I was going to major in aerospace engineering. A lot of people try to tell me that that might not be a great thing to do because it's really hard, and you kind of box yourself into a very narrow set of careers. Uh, but I knew it's exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I, that's what I studied. I had one internship in college the summer before my senior year. I worked at Sikorsky 
working on helicopters. Um, and again, I mention that because the three years prior, I was a lifeguard and a swim coach. I had fun during the summers. Um, I did apply to internships, but I didn't get the ones I wanted, so I decided not to waste my time. Um, so have fun with your life while you're getting prepared to be an engineer. And I still got into a really good grad school, so it wasn't all bad. Um, I went to MIT and I studied aerospace engineering also there, uh, focusing on human factors because I've always wanted to be an astronaut. If I can't be an astronaut, I want to work with them. So that's kind of what I did. Um, I developed uh, a new control system for astronaut jetpacks, which is pretty much the coolest sentence you can say about your research. Um, and it set me up for some really cool internships after I graduated. I traveled to Germany. I lived there for about a year working at the European Astronaut Center. Um, and it was really cool to be there and see the differences between how Europeans train their astronauts after having partnered with uh, JSC um, and seeing how we train our astronauts here. So it was a really cool um, experience to be over there. And then I moved here to Texas and I interned again um, in the EVA operations group at Johnson Space Center. Um, and they help train astronauts to perform spacewalks. Um, and then I decided it was time to get a real life job. So instead of interning forever, I got hired at Boeing. And I'm a human factor systems engineer for the CST-100 Starliner. What exactly do I do? What do human factor systems engineers do? I'm going to make it really simple. Um, I pretend to be an astronaut. Um, pretty much every day I go into work, I, I don't get to wear the suit every day, unfortunately. Uh, but I step through procedures that astronauts do. I work through all the operations. We have mock-ups. We have simulators. Um, I help develop those, but really I, I learn how to do them myself so that I can train the astronauts who are going to be our test subjects. Um, and we perform testing. This is our mock-up over in Building 9 at JSC. It's a full-scale mock-up of our spacecraft. Um, and we have the astronauts test our design. And we get feedback from them, which in turn helps us to design a spacecraft that's safe and efficient for our crew members to use. Um, and so this picture here is going to be our first crew, our flight test crew, uh, launching some point next year, fingers crossed. Um, and they're going to be going to the space station on our spacecraft um, as the first American astronauts to head back to the space station from American soil since 2011, which is awesome. So to conclude, every day I pretend to be an astronaut. I have a ton of fun at work. It never feels like a job. And that's what I encourage you guys to find, is something that doesn't feel like a job to you, something that you can have fun with. And if you fill your weekends with it, it's fun. It's, it's the same as you know playing at the pool as a lifeguard, but more fun than that. Thank you very much for having me. All right, next up, we're going to have Andy share a little bit about his story. <laughs> Hey, thank, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me this morning. It's an honor to speak with you all and an honor to share the stage with these two brilliant, uh, talented engineers. I'm just a computer geek and a space geek, so we'll go through that. A um, little bit about me. Um, originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, born and raised. Never lived outside the Cincinnati area until about 2015. Um, then I moved to Houston. I think the, the saying is, I got here as soon as I can. Uh, so. Love Houston now. Um, went to high school, took, uh, unlike uh, Selena, I did take uh, advanced placement classes. So I, I do encourage you to do that if that's something that you want to do. If that isn't, if you want to be an artist or if you want to be an accountant, we have jobs in the space industry that let you do those things that you love, just like Selena said. Uh, I'm a runner. I love running. I've been running since uh, high school. I was in cross country and track in high school, and I cannot imagine not being able to run. Although I didn't run my super long distance, started in my 40s. So I didn't run my first half marathon until I was 42. Since then, I've run eight half marathons and one full marathon. I think I'm one and done on the marathons. Uh, it's, pre it's pretty brutal. But I did do the Houston, 
uh, marathon. And if you ever want to run an organized race, the Houston Marathon and Half Marathon is awesome. Uh, super support, people out there cheering you on. It's an incredible experience. And um, I like to integrate things that I do. So running and space, if I can do that, I like to do that. So here is a picture of me with one of my buddy Craig's. And if you look in the, if you look in the corners of the picture, you'll see the medals that we got. This is the Space Coast Half Marathon in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Those are space shuttles. So we, the last five years, we got space shuttle medals. The, the next four years, we'll get program medals, Gemini, Mercury, Apollo, uh, shuttle. So it's, it's, it's really fun to do. Um, I'm also a DJ. Uh, just, yes, I do. I do scratches. I, lo I love doing that. Uh, I like to thank my mom for giving me my uh, love of music. I listen to all genres of music. Um, the, the left side of the screen you see there is me DJing at a social event. That's actually how I met Casey is one of these NASA socials. So NASA can't do, we can't advertise, but we can do social media outreach. Um, so that's how I met Casey. Um, the lower picture here on my left, your right, I DJed at the flight operations director at Fajita Fest out at Ellington Field. So I was in a hangar with jets. DJing is crazy, man. It is it is crazy experience. Uh, the top picture is of me DJing at a friend's wedding in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It's called the Air Zoo. And if you look, it's hard to see, but all the way at the top above the light, there's a black like triangle. That's the wing of an SR-71 Blackbird, which is an incredible plane. If you don't know what it is, go Google it. But I got to DJ under the wing of an SR-71 Blackbird. Incredible experience. I love aviation as well. Um, I have about 33 hours towards my private pilot certificate. If you love to fly or have ever wanted to fly, highly encourage you to go to a local airport, find a, a certified flight instructor, and take a, take a, a discovery flight. It's, it's an incredible experience just to get up there in a small plane and see the world from you know two or 3,000 feet. It's incredible. Um, also love space, as if you couldn't tell. Uh, I took this picture. I love photography. This is the last launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery in 2011. Um, I, again, got to experience this because of my social media interaction with NASA. Um, 150 of my closest friends got to experience this launch from the press site, and it reignited my, my passion to work at NASA. Uh, I, I've wanted to work here since I was a little kid. And at that time, I didn't have a college degree. So this was 2011, so it's only seven years ago. Um, so I figured out what I needed to do. I went back to school. I got my college degree. And in 2014, I graduated from the University of Illinois at Springfield. That's my son. He's now 16, so he's taller than me. Uh, this is two of the most pr proud moments of my life in one picture. My son and graduating from college. Incredible. I love it. Thanks. So yeah, um, I interned at uh, Johnson Space Center doing software development, and then I was uh, lucky enough to be offered a position as a space station flight controller in the flight operations directorate. Um, I'm basically uh, IT support for the space station. Uh, so I get to work with these wonderful people. As you've heard probably, or maybe some of your parents or friends' parents work at NASA, we're one big family. And to be in that family is an incredible experience. And this is where my remote office is. So I get to work on computers on the space station. Computers, networks, wireless. We have wireless on the space station just like you have wireless in your home. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my story. Um, I, I really appreciate one final thought. Um, just like my experience, uh, your path to where you want to go is probably not a straight line. It's going to be zigzag. It took me a long time to get where I am. But be persistent. Um, stay focused. And if, if things get in your way, just say, OK, I, I need to deal with this now, but it's not going to hold me back. Um, this is my contact information. If, if we uh, don't answer one of your questions today, Feel free to contact me. Uh, my email, my inbox is always open. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, and that's my website. So I thank you for letting me speak with you this morning, and uh, have a great time. Thank you.
Okay, and to round out our panel, we'll have Tiffany Swarmer. Hey, okay. well, good morning, you guys. I am so excited to be here at the uh, first Tech Challenge kickoff. I have practiced that like six times, and I think it's the first time I said it right. A uh, little nervous, but uh, following those two amazing people is going to be a little tough, but I'll give it my best. Hmm. Okay, so a little bit about my background. You guys already kind of know. I got a Bachelor of Science in Biology. Um, and then I took several years because I had really no idea what I wanted to do. I loved space, but I was a biologist, and it didn't really seem to fit together at the time. I wasn't an engineer. I wasn't a mathematician. Um, I really wasn't good with computers. Um, <laughs> So I was trying to figure out a way to involve myself. And then I found this program at the University of North Dakota called Space Studies with a focus in human factors. That's right, a focus in the squishy side, focus in the humans. Uh, I was very, very excited. And so I took the opportunity. And as soon as I reached North Dakota, the first thing I saw was this habitat here, this inflatable lunar Martian analog habitat. Couldn't believe my luck. I was going to work on this. Um, and so you can see here over uh, up top, so it's an inflatable structure around a steel rigid structure. And basically, they'll have crews of three to four that will live there from 10 to 30 days while they simulate space missions on the moon or Mars so that we can get a better understanding of what it's going to take for people to explore long duration. And they're doing this at the undergrad and the graduate level. They get high schoolers to come in and help. They get all sorts of people to come in and help. So. It's a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, so this was an opportunity I was not expecting to get. Um, and I don't think anybody was. So the University of North Dakota has the Human Spaceflight Laboratory, where they develop IVA, which is intravehicular activity suits, and planetary analog suits for lunar and Martian exploration. Um, I showed up. So my boss, uh, up there you can see the, the Argentinian man in the background. Um, I showed up and I said, I want to work. I want to volunteer. And he said, okay, what do you do? And I said, I'm a biologist. And he said, okay, what else do you do? <laughs> uh, so I said, I'm an EMT. He went, yeah, I don't really need a biologist EMT. So I asked him, what do you need? And he said, I need somebody to do this paperwork. I need somebody to do the institutional review board, the hazard analysis. And I said, okay, do I get to be part of the team? And uh, so I spent the first six months bored out of my mind, staring at suits across the room, filling out paperwork, stacks and stacks and stacks of paperwork. And eventually, I was lucky enough to win a spot as one of the suit testers. Um, I beat out some of the guys. I'll have you guys know. But, uh, <laughs> um, and it was an amazing opportunity. Um, also, while I was at North Dakota, I had an opportunity to participate in an analog mission. So I spent 120 days with the high seas. Um, and ultimately, they are on the slopes of Mauna Loa volcano at about 8,500 feet. You can see the picture over here in the corner. A little bit of the solar panel, a little bit of habitat. And that background right there, that looks very, very much like the Tharsis region of Mars. Um, so very volcanic, very difficult. Uh, you can kind of see up in the corner there, that's the one window. We had one window. And I can tell you at, at sunset time, it was a hot commodity. Um, you had to almost elbow your way in. Um, and, but basically, it was 878 square feet, and six people lived there for 120 days. They also did an eight-month and a year-long um, mission after mine. Uh, so what did we do while we were in there? <laughs> Sorry, the, the really fun picture is a little grainy. It's the best one I could get. But uh, honestly, we did a lot of work. Uh, I, 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 we did a lot of planning. We did a lot of prepping, a lot of monitoring systems. We did a lot of tedious jobs. Um, you were expecting it to be really fun and exciting, and it had moments, but it was a lot of planning. So you can see us, my, me and my crew members there, kind of planning. Uh, we grew plants to supplement our food. Uh, as you go down, you can see down here, waste management. So we used to like compact our trash to as small a space as possible, because we had no room to stow it. Um, so we really had to make it as small as possible. Uh, while I was there, I had the opportunity to, oh, hold on. There we go. Sorry, guys. Uh, I fell in love with planetary EVAs. 
Uh, now these suits are about 50 pounds each, and the terrain, as you can tell in some of the images, is pretty rough, pretty steep. Uh, we would go out for three to four hours, we would collect a lot of samples. Not an easy time, but I absolutely loved it, and it was a great place to uh, find such a passion. After that, I couldn't believe it, I got a phone call, and somebody actually wanted to pay me <laughs> uh, to do work with analogs. So Johnson Space Center gave me a call and said, hey, we want you to come down and we want you to run and work with this beauty over here in the corner, this absolutely gorgeous facility called HERA, the Human Exploration Research Analog. Uh, and basically, they will take four people, and those four people will live anywhere from seven to 45 days in about 800 square feet. Um, you can see some of the space here. Uh, once again, sorry about the grainy pictures. But you can see some of the space, so they have real space systems that they will interact with. Um, although I will say they have the most luxurious bathroom system uh, that I've ever seen in an analog, so <laughs> probably not quite as space-like. Um, while I was with Hera, um, I started to really want to do real space operations. I had been in the analog world for several years. I really, really wanted a chance to do, put my hands on real space ops. So I started, and it took me about a year. Um, you know, it's, it's really funny. It's kind of tough to convince somebody to hire you when you have absolutely no experience in what you want to do. So um, it took a lot of time to really convince somebody to hire me. But after about a year, I landed myself a job with the Crew Systems Group as a trainer and a subject matter expert. And basically, we help teach the astronauts how to live in space. We're focused on habitability. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, that does mean the toilet. Uh, <laughs> You can see the corner, uh, corner shot up there. That is the waste hygiene compartment on the International Space Station. Uh, my family has not let me live it down yet. And there's even a joke about me getting some plumber tools for Christmas. Uh, so, But we also do other systems, such as the galley, handhold. You can kind of see the crew down here eating. Um, and so it, it really is focused on the habitability of space. Uh, I just want to leave you guys with one thing today. Um, and ultimately that is I was lucky enough to get the opportunities that I got because I showed up. Um, I showed up and I did really what needed to be done. Uh, I absolutely love what I do and never thought I'd get the chance to do it, but I still went and showed up even when I thought I wasn't going to get the chance. So uh, I am very, very excited to, to learn more about this today, and thank you guys so much for your time. Okay, well, I'd like to start off this discussion by asking our panelists, what's the latest and greatest and cool stuff going on in your world? So, Selena, would you like to kick us off? I'd love to. Uh, so, I touched on it a little bit in my presentation. Uh, we are in the middle of a huge human in the loop test campaign. Um, so, the design is 99% done for our spacecraft. Uh, we, the, the other parts of the program are doing environmental tests on the real spacecraft. We've got three in the process of being built. Um, but over here in my corner, we are taking astronauts, teaching them all the different operations and putting th them through scenarios uh, to test the workload of our system, to test the usability, to see if they make any errors um, and find ways that we can improve our design with that 1% that's left um, and see if we can make the operations a little better. So right now we're focusing on um, display interaction, computer simulations. So we've got a really cool simulator that's about a quarter of the cockpit with flight hardware displays, um, flight control, hand controllers so that they can actually fly the thing and manually dock and manually enter. Um, and we train these astronauts up to the, the skill level that we expect our astronauts to be once they fly. Um, and we get great feedback from them to, to help refine our system. Sounds like a lot of new computers and technology. Yeah, it's super fun. <laughs> so Andy, what's going on in the IT world over at JSC? Well, we just uh, released a system on board that increased the, uh, the capability for the crew members to actually access the internet. The crews had internet access on board for quite a few years, but it's been fairly slow, like dial up, you know, like your phone lines. It's not even close to, to, to your cable modem or, or anything like that. But recently we released a system on board so that the crew members can just use their iPads. They connect to a separate wireless network and they're, they're 
just on the internet, just like you and I. So it, it, it gives the crew a lot better experience, so they feel more connected, and it gives the crew a, a lot better psychological feeling uh, so that they're connected to the ground. So that's what, that's what I'm working on right now. Do you have to give the crew the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> Uh, yeah, occasionally. <laughs> so, they, so I can't connect. So did you try turning it off and turning it back on again? <laughs> so yeah, we do we do it just like here on the ground. So Tiffany, with crane, uh, training the crew, is there anything new in your office? Uh, so we have quite a few new systems that are up and coming as we try to develop systems for exploration class missions. So we actually have a new toilet getting ready to go on board. Uh, <laughs> It's going to follow me my whole life, I guess. <laughs> but so we haven't. It's network connected. <laughs> it is. We actually get real time data. <laughs> oh, so, and uh, another thing that's really, really exciting right now is the commercial crew. Um, so we have the Orion systems, we have the commercial crew, and we are hard at work trying to make sure that we get training programs and understanding of the technology to really develop a good training program for the astronauts. Okay, well this year the FCC challenge is um, centered around exploring uncharted planets and robots are initially sent to explore before we send the squishy humans, right? So why are we sending, why do we send the robots instead of humans initially? Um, okay, so in my time at high seas and focusing on planetary exploration, one of the really important things is that although it's wonderful to have human beings go, a lot of times we need the support of robotics to make sure we can really explore some of this dangerous terrain that humans just can't go safely. Um, another interesting component is if we really want to keep some of these sites on the moon and Mars pristine and untouched by humans to understand if there was life there and we didn't bring it, um, robotics and robots are going to play a large role in that. Do you have anything to add to that, Selena? Sure, just to add a little bit, um, and again, my focus is the human squishy part. Um, robotics can really enhance what the human does. So I know this competition is going to be focused on robots as what we think of being robots. but. Um, in a way, our spacecraft is a robot. It can work autonomously. It can enhance what the human can do. There are a lot of different things that can do that also. The, the research that I did for my uh, grad program, the jetpacks, um, was to enhance this planetary, uh, planetary exploration, um, give, give the astronauts something that'll help stabilize them and minimize their impact on the environment that they have. So uh, a lot of times you'll see robots and humans working really closely together to do things better than either the robots or the human could do by themselves. Just to add that, um, just like you have, you know, your, your Google Assistants, your, your Alexas and your Ceres, as we move further out into exploration and beyond the moon, out to Mars, into deep space, the, the spacecraft is going to have to be autonomous. So you can think of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning as also part of that robotic piece. So we need, we need the vehicle to almost maintenance itself. So being able to, uh, to introduce machine learning and robotics is going to be a key part of that exploration mission. Sort of like Hal, but he won't turn on you. <laughs> no, if you know what Hal is. Well, along those I'm Sorry, that I can't do that. Along that line, you know, with robotics technology advancing like it is, how do you see the, div the division of labor uh, shifting among humans and robots in future missions? Uh, so we were, we were kind of joking about this a little earlier, and I'm hopeful it will shift towards the robots, mm -hmm. um, not because I'm lazy, but because I want more time to be able to go explore on my own, and robots can really do a lot of the mundane, repetitive tasks. Um, I'm not sure that we had an agreement, though. <laughs> so I, I absolutely do agree with that, you know, and, and what you said earlier about making sure that um, we sort of explore the train with robots first, make sure that we overcome the dangers that are there. We understand what we're really doing there. We do want to protect the environments that we're going to. Uh, but of course, you know, I, I don't want to just send robots back to the moon or Mars. I want to send humans. Yeah, I think 
I think it's going to the the mundane tasks, just just like Tiffany said, are going to be assigned to robots. So if you need to do any type of dangerous extravehicular outside the spacecraft or vehicle maintenance or repairs, we're, we're probably going to want to send the robots. But for, for those delicate tasks that we can't program the robots to do, we absolutely still need the humans out there to do that task. And you both mentioned hazards. Um, what are some of those hazards related to space exploration that you'll have to think about when planning for missions and even during your training? So space is a very extreme environment. I don't know if you guys know it, but people aren't supposed to survive in space. <laughs> um, so there, there are a lot of things that go into designing a spacecraft, designing the space station, um, thinking about these long duration space exploration missions. Um, it's a vacuum, it can be really hot, it can be really cold, there's radiation, um, you're really far from Earth, there are certain communication dropouts, especially as you go farther and farther, it's harder and harder to stay in communication with people back here on Earth. Um, and so, that, I mean, that's where robots can come in because they, they can kind of do their own thing without that much guidance um, when you design them well. I think um, going back to assigning tasks to robots, uh, one of the hazards that we're trying to uh, mitigate is, is, the, is the human piece, so the physiological and the psychological piece. The astronauts on board the International Space Station exercise about two and a half hours a day, and that's just to keep their body healthy in the microgravity environment. And they're only there from anywhere between six months and a year. When we move out to uh, exploration out to Mars, those missions are going to be years long. So we want to make sure that the human is healthy, both physi physi physiologically as well as mentally. And, and pushing those tasks off of maintenance to, to robotics is going to help ensure that they also stay safe and, and healthy. Um, I, I think that when you, when you talk about sending robots out and you you eliminate a huge part of that hazard because you eliminate the human, right? So we, part of the reason why our, our program has been taking so long, and you might have heard in the news some of our schedule slips, um, is because there's, there's no trade-off for safety of the human. Um, we have to make sure our atmosphere inside our spacecraft is within these very narrow limits, same with communication, same with food and water, same with pressurization and O2, CO2 control, all of those things that if it's just a robot, you don't have to worry about as much. Now granted, if you're taking payloads up, science payloads, things like that, there are certain environmental um, hazards that you need to control. You don't want fire, so you can't have the O2 too high, things like that, but it does make it a there are fewer things to worry about when it's just a robot, which is why we've already seen robots go to Mars and we haven't seen people. Um, so it's a great, great first step. Uh, and I think even, even when we do get to the point where we have enough of the science and support to send humans into deep space, um, robots are going to remain a huge, huge integral part of that. Absolutely. And you mentioned talking about um making sure everything is safe, everything is tested. So designing, testing, retesting is critical to make sure everything works um, before being launched into space. So can you tell us a little bit about what goes into the designing and testing to make sure it's going to work up there? Repetition. Uh, we, I've been with Boeing for about three years, but this program has been going many years more than that. Um, and we've had mock-ups and simulators, maybe of lower fidelity and not quite where they are right now. But we've had astronauts involved because, again, my portion is the human interaction with it. Um, we've had mock-ups, we've had test articles that humans interact with, get feedback, roll back into the design. And so everybody, it's really a group of sus subsystems in a whole system. So you really need to think of it like that. Um, make sure you're thinking of your one little piece of it um, in the context of the larger thing. So just iterations over and over, you're always making it better. And still, I, the design will never be 100% done. We're done with our design phase, but I still say 99% because there's always that 1% that you're going to learn once you get up there in the real environment. So testing really never finishes. 
can very much concur with that. Every time you do another test or every time you put a person in a suit or a different person, you get a totally different result. Um, now, you get a lot of similarities, but you get so many differences that it's difficult because each human being has its own has their own needs. Um, and I can I can remember uh, so at North Dakota when we were focusing on designing lunar planetary suits, uh, I am five foot three. I was the shortest and smallest person on the suit testing team, and that meant that everything hit me wrong because the suit was designed for a five foot nine, hundred and sixty seventy pound male. Nothing fit right. Uh, so there was all sorts of design considerations, and the suit was done. The design was at its 99%, so they had to, after the fact, start to make alterations. They had to add padding in places. They had to try to fix joints so that it would actually bend where I could bend. I, I think a lot of engineers who don't have a background in human factors, even though they know they're building a system for human interaction, a lot of times they don't think about the human interacting with their system until the very end, uh, which is why it's really important for human factors engineers and people who do have that focus to be there from the very beginning. Um, and so we have seen a lot of things like that where the, the ECLIS team, the Environmental Control and Life Support System, they, they design their system per their specs. They, they have a system that meets all their needs. And then we say, hey, what if there's a failure and the crew needs to operate this valve? You put that valve underneath the floor, locked under a closeout with 12 different bolts. They have to go get the tool to come. So there's a lot of things that engineers need to be encouraged to remember when they're working with a human. All this stuff is amazing to think about that you don't normally think about. And I'm sure it's all incredibly expensive too. Um, I know with these teams, money management is really important. They have to raise funds, manage their funds, design and market their team brand and do outreach. So how does that, um, in the real world, does that play out the same way? Can you elaborate on that? I think I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a stab at that. It, it absolutely matters. Um, obviously, from the NASA point of view, it, it's a government program, so we're responsible to the taxpayers. That's you or your parents or your friends. Um, so we absolutely need to make sure that we are spending your money wisely on the projects that we're assigned. Um, we also, as I said earlier, we, as NASA, we can't advertise. So we use social media outreach. Um, that's, again, that's the way I got my start. Actually. I credit Twitter for me having my job at NASA because I got selected from a NASA social media outreach program. So it's, it's, you really have to think, just as Selena was going back to thinking of your, your small system in the context of the whole. The whole is not only the engineering piece, but it's also the project management, your documentation, your outreach. Um, it's, it's important to think about the big system so you might be focused on your little um, propulsion section here, but you also want to make sure that your teammate understands what you're doing and that you integrate the system as a whole, not only from the money management aspect, but also from the, sub the subsystem aspect. I think that integration is key, what you just said. Um, integrating early and often can save you a lot of money, um, and we need money. Uh, if you guys know anybody, money's great. Um, but so if you can integrate early and you can work with teammates and you can really understand what their needs are and what they may be a little bit more flexible on, you really can save yourself some money in the long run. And integration, it, it really comes down to cost and risk trade. So each of your teammates is going to come to the table with something they might want something that they think is the priority, and you guys are gonna have to compromise, you're gonna have to figure out what, if you don't have the money to get everything you want, which nobody ever does, again, we would, I mean, the reason why our schedule has slipped a couple times is because we don't have all the money to throw at it to do everything we want, and it takes a long time to figure out what is worth risking to not put into our spacecraft. And you guys are gonna face the same sort of challenges and, and it really comes down to teamwork. Deciding as a team, 
thinking through all the different possibilities, how, how, you, how you make that trade between cost and risk. Yeah, and if you haven't heard about the, the, the triangle, it's good, cheap, and fast. Pick two, can't have all three. Good, cheap, or fast. So. Well, it sounds like everyone has a really important to part to play in each of these missions. And it does come down to teamwork. And I know all of these teams have their different roles and their different teams. So can you elaborate on how important teamwork is in your respective areas? I kind of reiterating what I said before, all the subsystems need to work together to make something that actually works in its intended way. So you can come up with a system that um, does what you need to do at one time, does what your teammate needs it to do at one time, but might not work together. So at, from the very beginning, teamwork is so important, not just because you need to make sure that each of you have your own part that works together later, uh, but because your idea might not be as good as everybody's ideas put together. And so it's really important to collaborate from the very beginning um, and have people to bounce ideas off of to tell you you're wrong, to tell you you're right, um, to, to say that needs glitter, whatever. I like glitter. So, it doesn't. <laughs> so uh, one thing I like to, to stress is, is diversity and inclusion. So having a diverse team, whether that's um, age or gender or background, um, it's important to get those different ideas together because, as, as Selena said, together your ideas are going to be better. Um, you may not think of something because you, you don't come from the same background as your teammate. Um, also, uh, those, those teammates that are, are kind of quiet or maybe introverts, um, ask them, go up to them and ask them questions. Say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, because they may have something that, that they think, but they're not going to come, come out and say it. So feeling included um, and asking them those questions is very important. It's going to build your team strength. Yeah, I mean, I think they said it very well. Teamwork is really what is going to get you through when things are rough. Um, I can tell you when you're really frustrated and you're not sure what direction to go, if you can turn to your team and ask, you suddenly have four, five, six minds working on the same problem. Um, and it's very often that as a team, if your whole team is happy and healthy, you're going to be able to be more productive. You're going to really be able to develop and create some pretty amazing things. So it sounds like teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I think I've heard that before. Yeah, maybe. But I mean, what it boils down to is this slide is hard. It's um, you have to come together as a team. We're going to have to get with international collaborators to make some some of our missions work because those are dreams. And uh, you know, you have rockets that have to escape Earth's gravity and they're expensive, and you have to protect the pink squishy thing, the human. So. There's all these factors you have to think about, and, and radiation, communication, life support. It's a lot. So why do we do it? Why do we explore? Really going for the easy question, huh? <laughs> so to me, exploration is synonymous with humanity. Um, we explore our environment every day, whether it's our house, whether it's the robotic challenge, we are constantly trying to learn more and explore, and it has been nothing but beneficial. Um, and I think that it is important as we reach out and expand humanity into the stars, it's important to remember that this, this yes, it comes at a cost, but what we get for exploring uh, is, is just priceless. Not to sound like a MasterCard commercial. <laughs> Yeah, I, I echo what Tiffany said. We, as humans, we've, we've explored since the early days. We're explorers when we are born. That's what we do. When we're, when we're children, we're looking around our environment. We're crawling, we're walking, we're feeling. And I think um, as adults, sometimes we lose that inner child. And it's, it's important. Um, we... We, we run marathons, we climb mountains, we, we explore space because it's hard, just like JFK said. And, and we like to challenge ourselves. 
It gives us a sense of accomplishment. And it also gives us great reward. So all of these things that we do out in exploration, they apply back down here on Earth to you and your family and humanity in general. So I think exploration is, is key. We, we do it because it's part of us. It's part of humans. It's part of our DNA. I absolutely agree. I think humans are by nature curious. And we, we explore because we want to understand what's out there. We want to understand ourselves better. Um, and in the process of doing that, we discover awesome things that help us in our everyday life down here on Earth. I think a lot of people don't, don't think enough about the, the very real everyday impacts of the, the science that's going on on the space station and in past uh, space exploration programs. And in, in really short, it's just, it's there and it's cool. And it gives, it's so inspirational. It's, I don't know anybody who hasn't just sat and stared at the stars at one point in his or her life and just been in awe about the cosmos and how big it is and how cool it is. Um, and I think we're just each doing our part to, to find out a little bit more about that. Thank you. I think sometimes we forget we're explorers every day, and that's maybe something you can take with you after this when you start into your challenge uh, this season. So we're going to wrap up our, our panel portion here. So to, um, I'd like to go, we'll start with you, Tiffany. Any last final thoughts before we take questions? Um, I just want to say, so I, I started looking into this program uh, when I was asked to speak and was just amazed. Um, what you guys are about to embark on is so exciting, uh, and I am looking forward to following it. Um, and so the only thing I can say is be present and take chances when you can. I would say we need to, ex we need to explore together. We need to, we need to put past our differences and come together both as, as, as a team, which you're, which you're working on here, as well as a community and, and society in general. So take the time here, um, enjoy what you're doing. I wish I had this experience when I was your age. It, it's incredible, as Tiffany said, I was looking in, and the things that you get to do, that, that intro video that we saw, I was like, wow, man, I wanna do that. I wanna do that. So. Take, take some time, enjoy the experience, and, and write things down. Take a little journal. That way you can come back to it when you're a little bit older and you can look at these things. And, and some of the things that you've learned, you may be able to apply them later. So experience it, take it all in. And have a ton of fun with it. You're not gonna be good at anything that you don't think is awesome. Um, you, you might have the skill for it, but if you don't enjoy it, you're, you're not going to put everything that you have into it. So take, like they said, take chances, um, be in the moment here, have a lot of fun. And at the end of this, if you found it fulfilling, if you had a ton of fun, do it again. And if you didn't, find something else that will bring you that same joy and passion. Because ultimately, in STEM fields, we need people who are passionate about what they're doing. Those are the people who are going to discover the next big thing. They're going to design the next cool spaceship. Um, and so we, we need people like you who have that sort of passion and love what they do. Thank you, guys. That's all wonderful advice. And thank you for sharing your passion with us. So I'm sure some of you have some questions you'd like to ask our experts. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll point and make sure you speak up real loud and then I'll repeat the question. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Oh, has anyone launched to space other than the US or Russia? Humans? Yes, sorry, humans. Yeah, um, the, the Chinese have, so the, I believe that, that the U.S., Russia, and China are the only three that have human spaceflight capability. So I believe it was in the mid-2000s when the Chinese launched their 
uh, human space flight program. So those are the three countries that I know about. Three to my knowledge that have launched, but I would like to say that I know India is very close and has been working really hard to launch people into space. Um, and there's several other countries that I'm not quite thinking of right now that have been working hard to try to develop the capability to launch humans into space. And that being said, even though um, those are the only countries that have the capability to launch from their soil, tons of countries, tons of people from different nationalities have launched to space, um, thanks to ESA and JAXA and the Canadian Space Agency and NASA as well. Yes, sir? What does it take to get into MIT? Uh, well, I, I told you my story. It takes something different for everybody, honestly. Uh, and when I was there, it, it was full of people from different backgrounds. And I will say, I applied as an undergrad, and I didn't get in. Um, so if you get rejected once, don't be scared of trying again. So I ended up there for grad school. Um, and really, again, I'm going to harp on the fact um, that you just have to love what you do, because you'll be really good at it if you love what you're doing. And so stick with it. Don't let challenges um, get in your way. Don't let people telling you that it's going to be hard and you're going to have no fun in college because you're studying rocket science. Um, I had a great time, and I still ended up at one of the best grad schools in the world. Okay. Yes, ma'am? What steps did you take to become an aerospace engineer? Um, I decided that I was going to major in aerospace engineering. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I always loved space when I was younger. Um, but I was also, I was an athlete. I was a musician. I acted in plays. So I didn't have a ton of free time in my schedule to focus on really STEM-specific extracurriculars. And that's a really good way um, to learn about it, to see if you really like it, to see if you'll be able to handle it in college. Um, but you don't need to do it. So really, I, I took science and math. I loved them. Um, I, I didn't get the opportunity to take the advanced ones in high school. But if you can, you should, um, if you know that's what you want to do. And pick a school that has an actual aerospace engineering program, because a lot of um, a lot of engineering schools, even if they're focused engineering schools, they may not have, have aero astro. They might have mechanical with a aero concentration, which is also a great opportunity too. It opens you up to the same things. Um, but really, all you need to do is decide you want to do it. Yeah, and uh, like what you just said, uh, making that decision is one of the difficult things. And once you make it, you get to move forward on that and go on that path. But I want to point out, I started off a biologist who was looking to become a doctor. And I changed paths late in life. And I think Andy has similar and still was able to go down a different path. So just because you go down this path and think that this is what you're going to do, if you don't love it, like Selena has said, you can still change. You can still find something that you want to do at any time in your life. Yeah, I, I worked in the financial industry before I worked in the aerospace industry, so that's a little bit different. Uh, one, thing, one, one thing I would recommend is, is ensure that if you are looking at an engineering program, ensure that it's what's called ABET accredited, A-B-E-T. Um, that's one of the challenges that I had to uh, actually becoming a civil servant at NASA is the engineering degrees that NASA requires are ABET accredited, so that's, that's one tip. Um, just check that that is accredited by ABET. Um, over here. What's next after college to pursue your career? Show up and don't leave. <laughs> Uh, for, for me, a, a lot of it is networking, um, and I, I think that's kind of a hard concept to grasp when you haven't gotten to the point where you're looking for internships and jobs, uh, but a lot of people look the same on paper, um, and so going out, going to in-person job fairs and finding somebody on LinkedIn and sending them a message, um, and a lot of this might be kind of a little too far ahead of where you, you are right now, um, but really it's every industry is a people industry, and when people know who you are um, and can put a personality to a resume, 
that's really, really important. Yeah, building your contact network is is incredibly important. Again, I think that's one of the reasons that, that I found work here in this industry is is because of the people that I that I met on social media, the people that I met in person, the people that I that I met through LinkedIn and, and these social sites. Uh, build your contact network. You you've got one contact already. I sent I put my email address up there. So you you are welcome to contact me if you have any other questions or, or you wanna you wanna get started. Um, when you're ready, shoot me an email. I'll help you out. I know that um, NASA and other organizations in the space industry have internships and co-ops. So I know NASA even has high school internships. So I think you can go that route as well. Yeah, intern.nasa.gov is the website to check out for NASA internships. And as Casey said, we do accept uh, high school juniors as well as seniors. So if you want to get an internship during the summer of one of those years between your junior and senior, senior in college, check out that website. and and uh, apply. There's some really cool opportunities there. And do stuff like this. This is an awesome first step. No pun intended first. <laughs> She's here all Together. morning. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Okay, this young man up here. Um, he, he never worked at NASA. Oh, the question was, was my space geek dad, did he work at NASA um, or did he just love science? And um, he, so he actually went to MIT. He studied aerospace engineering. <laughs> um, see any common threads? And he ended up working uh, with cars. So he, again, you can do a lot of things with an engineering degree, even if it's focused on aerospace. Um, he works for the Department of Transportation on automated cars. So super cool job. Definitely just, you know, he always had this pa the passion for space. He wanted to be an astronaut when he was little, and that's kind of where I learned all of that stuff from when I was young. Okay. Way in the back. <laughs> so what's the exercise equipment we're gonna use going to Mars? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, and I could almost turn it around on you uh, because we need people to develop. They are currently developing the exercise equipment. Um, there's a lot of different types. Um, a lot of it is looking at keeping it really small. We're talking shoebox size exercise equipment, and it needs to keep cardio and muscle for these people. So they've been looking at, um, I can't quite think of the name, but uh, kind of like the rowing machine style, but just in a box. Um, flywheel, there's, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, so they've been looking at using flywheels because those can provide both resistance for muscle as well as cardio if you use it like a rowing machine. But they're still looking at ideas and how they're going to best be able to do that. And right now on station, they, they kind of have a few different things. And I'm not the station expert, so tell me if my, I'm wrong. But I know they have a treadmill, um, and you kind of bungee yourself down to get the feel of gravity on the treadmill. Uh, they've got an exercise bike, um, and they've got this thing called ARED, the Advanced... Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. There you go. Uh, it's... Yeah, it uses uh, basically hydraulics and air pressure to simulate weight lifting. Mm -hmm. So you can do deadlifts, you can do squats, you can do curls, uh, bench press. And my favorite story with this, so um, have you guys heard of Sunny Williams? She's one of the astronauts, she's actually one of ours, she's gonna be on our first operational mission. Um, she's awesome, she's a triathlete, and she Concur. did the first, what? Concur, she's yeah, awesome. She's so rad. Um, she did the first triathlon on the International Space Station. Um, she swam with the A-Red, she did arm exercises, she biked on the exercise bike, and then she ran on the treadmill. So I always think that's super cool that somebody's done a triathlon in space. Well, thank you all very much. You know, if you didn't get your question asked or answered in this session, um, our experts will be around when you're out looking at the playing field um, after the reveal. So let's please give a warm applause for our awesome panel here. So thank you, Selena and Antony, for sharing your expertise with the groups here today.
And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our FTC senior mentors, Sharon. So I, I know that y'all will all join me to uh, especially thank Space Center Houston. They have put all of this together for us today. Casey, for finding Tiffany, Andy, and Selena and bringing them here today to share their story that so many of you resonates with all the parts and pieces of FIRST. So if you would join me in thanking Space Center Houston for everything they've done for us today. Are we getting ready for reveal? Yeah. Woo! That's right. The problem is we can't do it until 11. So we're close. And I have my handy dandy phone here with the alarm set so we won't go past it. In fact, if we're really sneaky, we might be two minutes early just, just because that's how it should be done in Texas, right? A little early just to, to get there. But what I want to do is um, I want to introduce you to our team, the people you're going to be working with, whether you're a coach or a student, you're going to see us all through the season at all your different league. So I'd like to ask the team to come up here now. And if I can find Tommy, where is Tommy? Where is he? Stand up, come down, run, whatever. Run, Tommy. <laughs> okay, so let me just tell you a couple people. Isaac, I know you're going to recognize, and for the students, he's going to be the person you're going to come to most of the time. He is our field tech advisor for the season, for the region, for everybody. So he's the go-to with all your questions. We have a... <laughs> we have a new person in our... Um, in our team this year, and that would be Brian Melton. He's our financial manager, so um, making sure that all the money flows in the directions and places that it's supposed to go. So uh, introducing and welcoming Brian to come into the season. We have a new first senior mentor that's uh, part of our program, but she's not new to y'all. Most of you will recognize Dee Wallace but she has been selected by U.S. First Headquarters to be our first senior mentor for this year. So welcome, Dee. <laughs> and, of course, we still have Cheryl Mott. Most of you know her as the lady who sends uh, hello, hi, robot peeps. <laughs> so for all those emails, thank you for all the volunteers. And our judge advisor for the region, of course, is Tommy. He's been with us for a few years, and we appreciate that he hasn't uh, escaped even when his own children graduated. So, Tommy. <laughs> and to help the time go a little bit, we still have a few minutes left, um, we decided we would do a raffle. So most of you have not heard, but... Um, all of the robotics parts and pieces and locations at San Jacinto College has we moved over the summer. And uh, we took up literally about a gym space, but it was part of our, our locker room space. And so as we were going through that, we said, wow, Isaac especially said, Sledge, are you sure you need all this stuff? And Mott said, no. <laughs> and uh, Brian said, let's raffle it. So we have perimeters. We have tile sets. We have space stuff. We have um, contributions from uh, Pitsco. We have contributions from Rev Robotics. So we have put together grab bags. We've put together um, all kinds of stuff. And to make this go, what we are going to do is we're going to grab pieces, and we're going to grab a coach, uh, the team name, and we're going to grab out to see what it is that you get. You don't have to come. You can just hoop and holler. We'll staple it together, and when everything is finished, after the reveal, then on the stage is where the stuff is located. So right after reveal, when we go out to look at the actual elements that are out there, that's when you'll come to get it. Uh, before we do that, you know how commercials have to happen? 
Sorry, folks, here's our commercial. Uh, this year we've been very blessed. Not only did Space Center Houston provide this wonderful venue, all of these incredible presenters for us today, but we were blessed this year uh, to receive a very generous support from Lionel Basil and from the San Jacinto College Foundation. So we just want to recognize them. And of course, Qualcomm, who brings us our whole game and all that comes on at headquarters. So just so I can tell my boss, yes, I did mention San Jack. Uh, just to let you know, we appreciate their support, certainly Space Center Houston's support. And most importantly, we appreciate all you guys coming and being here today to, to, to celebrate this reveal. So we promised to get to the raffles. Just so you know, my teams are not entered. Ooh. Okay, pull the team. Oh, can you give us a beatbox? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the first winner is team 14477. Mr. Maynard. Mr. Maynard, the CRJ Lions won. And a Pitsco linear slide pad. Okay. Let's go linear slide pack. Next winner, 11640. And you are getting a grab bag. One four seven four nine. You're getting a fifty dollar registration credit on your uh, region dues. One four two three eight. And field perimeter set. One oh nine oh four. A perimeter set. One four four eight two. A fifty dollar credit on registration. One zero zero five six. Pitsco Gear Pack. Uh, this is temporary number Dory Robotics. Yeah. Field tiles. Yes. Tiles. One, four, six, zero, four. A Pitsco Gear Pack. One, zero, nine, six, three. And Tank tread kit. One, two, eight, five, seven. Perimeter set. One, four, two, nine, two. A Pitsco tornado motor. One, zero, seven, five, two. Another grab bag. One four four zero seven, and another grab bag. And who knows what's in those bags? Another temporary number, um, paranormal activity. Fifty dollar registration credit. One four five zero three, a grab bag. One two two three six. And a Pinsco tank, tank tread kit. One, one, eight, one, one. Field perimeters. Woo! Another temporary number, uh, the general FTC, Mr. Pertow. Field tiles. Woo! One, one, five, two, four. Pitsco Tornado Motor. One, one, nine, four, seven. A rev grab bag. All kinds of rev parts. Nine, one, nine, one. Another grab bag. One, two, eight, two, five. Pitsco Tornado Motor. One, three, one, two, nine. And a registration credit. Last one. 10404. The last grab bag. All 
If you have a perimeter kit, see me at the stage and I'll tell you about putting it together. So if you um, have a chance to make it to World, I'm sure you all will, uh, be sure you tell Rev and Pitsco thank you for the, all the things that they've offered up today for us. Um, I would also like to say thank you to Jane Taylor. Where is Jane sitting? Woohoo! she's way in the back. She is our FLL director, um, guru in charge of everything, and she's here today to, to help y'all Find out more about FLL because remember, part of your awards is the outreach and how can you help out with an FLL team. Uh, one of the things that Jane has done this year is in two weeks, that would be September 22nd, they are going to build um, part of the FLL props that are needed. And this is going to be a women in STEM build day. So this time we are going to be gender specific, but it is for um, women, girls that are on FLL, FTC, and FRC. So they're looking for you to help with this, and it would look great on your, for your awards of what's going on. And if you have questions, Jane brought some flyers for you today so that you can uh, take it with you and put that on your calendar. Remember then one week after that would be the, uh, the time that we would, uh, September 29th is the workshop about everything uh, at San Jack. So on the 29th at about nine in the morning, isn't it? Nine to three, uh, free, even free lunch. Uh, we'll do everything. We'll design, we will build, we will program. We'll talk about awards, we'll talk about refereeing, we'll talk about all of it. So come, bring everybody that you can, and it is you who will be leading this. So when Dee approaches you and says, hey, would you be willing to lead the workshop on block programming, lead the workshop on Android Studio, lead the work on how to use a screwdriver to build this thing, <laughs> If you were in the situation where you have only a box on that day, bring your box. We'll have plenty of people. We all know that uh, one of the hallmarks for FIRST is gracious professionalism. And as part of that, we know that we always help one another. It is definitely a cooperation that we participate in. And I have to tell you that as a mom, a grandma, a teacher, and all those other things wrapped right by my side, it's nothing like walking through the pits and seeing one team loan another team something. And I know your coaches feel exactly the same way. So um, there's a lot going on this season and we have a lot of things planned. Because of the way that uh, the first system works, I know there's a lot of coaches out there that wanna know what league are we playing in. We have uh, split the, the whole region from Palacios up to uh, Nacogdoches and beyond, over to College Station from the Gulf into regions. And uh, what we can tell you is that some of them are still gonna be leagues. Some, if you were in the West League, they're no longer able to host a league at this point. Uh, we had over 100 teams last year, Woohoo! At this point right now, we have 35 teams. Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, if we took 35 teams, put them into our seven regions, you'd have five teams each. And uh, Palacios might be playing in, um, you know, west side of Houston or something. So uh, you won't know what league you're in for a while. We're hoping by the 29th, everybody will sort of have settled in, you will at least have given, responded to Mott when she asked you, are you playing? Do you have a team? How many teams do you have? So all of that becomes important. I know as a teacher, you get so many emails or just as a parent, and you're like, yeah, I'll get to that tomorrow, I'll get to it tomorrow. Um, if you could get to it today, that would be <laughs> really helpful so that by the 29th, for sure, we can tell you where you are playing and which league you're in so you can set your dates so that you can 
can be all excited about that. Okay, so we're really close. So what I want to do is um, one of the people in our group who really usually works the hardest and gets the least amount of recognition for it is Mr. Isaac. So I want Mr. Isaac just to come up here for a minute. No. Okay, so I want y'all to know that it's because of him, really, all this stuff is here today. He's the one who worked, even though, you know, he's running fever yesterday. He doesn't tell me that until this morning when I say, are you almost here? And he goes, huh? <laughs> Clearly, you know, that, that when you're like, oh, I'm still in bed and I'm supposed to be on the road kind of thing. <laughs> but indeed, uh, he, is, he is the person who knows the most about your game. He is the first person in our group who saw this game this summer. So if you have questions when we go outside, he is the one who has heard directly from first who knows the most about the game at this point. So we're going to ask him after the reveal if he will be by the field instead of running and doing all those other things we would normally have him doing. We're going to ask him to be by the field, so if the coaches or the students have a question, we did not put a question box out today, so you don't have to go that far. But you can find him. He's the one who probably has the most information to share with you. So, so I'm thinking it's up to you now. We're, we're ready. Oh, I shouldn't touch this. <laughs> Is everybody ready? Yeah! Um, I know that there has been uh, a lot of anticipation for this game. Obviously, we know that it is uh, about space exploration or space oriented. That's why we're here. Uh, it is, from what I can tell you, an extremely fun game uh, with mechanics that we have seen uh, in other games and more importantly, uh, with a challenge, well, this is a new challenge that we've never seen before, obviously, but more importantly, in my opinion, this is possibly one of the most mechanically demanding uh, games, but I won't say any more. Uh, I hope that the, if the video is ready, uh, if we can show that so you guys can have a look for yourself. <laughs> Welcome back, astronauts, to the voyages of the first explorers on board their trusty vessel, the USS Qualcomm. The explorers have completed their journey to Planet X, a barren, inhospitable world that just so happens to be rich with both silver and gold unobtainium. On board, the crew makes ready for their mission, unaware of the peril they are about to face. Captain Collins, we've successfully completed our warp to Planet X. Telemetry data shows we've attained planetary alignment and are in stable orbit. On screen. It's breathtaking. Lieutenant Armstrong, surface scan. Hi, Captain. Surface reports indicate above average presence of both gold and silver unobtainium. We won't know how much of it until we run a subterranean scan from the surface. But there's a lot of it, Captain. Far more than we need. Attention all crew, this is your captain speaking. We have successfully found our prize and our mission is a go. Engineering, prepare to launch the rover. Roger that, Captain. The rover's ready to launch on your command. Captain Collins, I'm getting an intense spike in thermal activity emanating from the star. Captain, we're detecting a large gravitational wave heading out from the star, directly towards us and Planet X. Evasive action towards the star. Brace yourselves. Taking the hit, Captain. Shields are at 40%. We can't take another blast like that. What hit us? Uh, it looks like a solar storm, Captain. Uh, originating from the star. I'm scanning it now. Uh, the star is highly active and it's already building up for another energetic release. Looks like we just have a few minutes until another solar storm is generated. All right, crew. We have a mission to complete and we came all this way to do it. So we're going to roll the dice and make the play. Engineering, initiate the launch sequence. Aye, aye, Captain. Once the rover's on the ground, we need to be ready to strike. Double time, everyone. Seconds matter. Aye, aye, aye Captain. Captain. Let's do this.
Welcome to First Launch and the 2018-2019 First Tech Challenge game, Rover Ruckus, presented by Qualcomm. A team consists of two driver operators, a coach, and a robotic rover. The robot must be built from materials specified in the game manual and fit within an 18-inch sizing tool, but may expand after the match begins. And, for this year, must weigh no more than 42 pounds. Each match is played with four randomly selected teams, two per alliance. Your partner for one match may be your opponent for another. The game is played on a 12-foot square playing field with a foam tile floor and one-foot high walls. Two Alliance Neutral Craters sit in opposite corners of the playing field, and two Alliance Specific Depots are in the other corners. Navigation targets are placed in the center of each field wall. Four sampling fields contain minerals, two silver spheres, and one gold cube, which are randomly lined up in front of each corner. Fifty-two silver and eighty-six gold minerals are divided roughly evenly and placed in each crater. The lander sits in the center of the field with Alliance-specific landing zones marked by red and blue tape. Red and blue Alliance stations are taped off on opposite sides of the field, including the scoring referee stations. Prior to the start of the match, robots may be latched onto the lander. Robots that cannot be latched must start in the Alliance's landing zone. Robots may also be preloaded with a team marker. Teams may be as creative as they would like with their marker designs. Field personnel will randomize the minerals in the sampling fields, then the match is ready to start. Each match begins with a 30-second autonomous period. During this period, there are a number of ways for teams to score, using only pre-programmed instructions and sensor inputs. Robots that land on the playing field earn a landing bonus of 30 points. Robots that start in the landing zone are still eligible to play, but will not receive the landing bonus. Robots may use the four unique navigation targets to help orient themselves on the field. Robots claim their depot by placing their team marker in it for a claiming bonus of 15 points. If their alliance partner also places their marker in the depot, it is considered completely claimed and is protected through the remainder of the match. Robots that successfully move the gold mineral completely off of its starting location in the sampling field earn a sampling bonus of 25 points. But if a silver mineral also moves, your alliance loses that bonus. And finally, robots that successfully park in any of the craters will earn a parking bonus of 10 points. Following the autonomous period is the two-minute driver-controlled period. There are a number of ways to score points. Each mineral placed into an alliance's depot earns two points. Be careful, however, if the depot is not completely claimed, an opposing alliance may descore your minerals. Robots that successfully place silver minerals into the silver cargo hold earn five points each for their alliance. Robots that place gold minerals into the gold cargo hold also earn five points each for their alliance. But placing minerals into the incorrect cargo hold will not earn any points. The last 30 seconds of the driver controlled period is the end game. During this time, robots may continue scoring minerals and they may also earn bonus points. Robots that park partially in a crater will earn 15 points. However, if they go completely into the crater, they earn 25 points for their alliance. A robot that is deployed from the lander during the match and latches back on during the end game, lifting off of the playing field, will earn 50 points for their alliance. There are many ways to score in Rover Ruckus, but there are also rules that if not followed, will award points to your opponents. For example, Robots may not launch minerals into the lander from outside of the Alliance's landing zone. Robots may not block access to the lander. A robot may not control more than two minerals at a time unless the minerals are in the crater. 
and parts may not be deliberately detached from robots during a match. This has been a brief summary of the Rover Ruckus game. For complete rules, please read the entire game manual and remember to check the Q&A forum. Don't forget the most important rule of the First Tech Challenge, gracious professionalism. Good luck teams and have a great season. So, are you excited? Yes, okay. So we're going to as gracious and professional as I know you all are, uh, exit the theater so that you can actually see the elements on the field and ask questions and all that. So is there a, can we use both sides? Both sides, you can use, can they use the top? At the top also. What?